extremely happy to be joined on stage for the next session by a wonderful set of panelists. We're going to be digging into the urgency of threats to democracy and also talking about how civic tech might need to evolve in response to them. Um, between us, uh, between them, sorry, our panelists have a really broad view of what's going on, both in terms of the focus of their work but also the regions that they work on. And hopefully we'll give you some interesting examples of projects engaging with threats and how we can think about increasing their impact. Uh, we've got about an hour. Uh, I'm gonna kick off with some questions. And we've also got questions on Slido again, so do ask those. The code is 128242. Uh, and uh, you can use the barcode and select Mary Ward Hall to ask your questions. Um, panelists, I'm not going to go to everyone on every question, but if you want to answer on something, just let me know. Um, first of all, though, uh, I'm going to ask a question to the whole room, and the question is going to be a poll on Slido, and it's, uh, what democratic threat do you think civic tech has the biggest chance of helping to combat? So, once you've had a chance to enter your answers, we'll throw them up on screen and get the panelists uh, to say what they think about what's come up. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to turn to the panel, introduce them to you. Uh, our first guest is Elena puig Larari. Nearly right. Uh, she's the co-founder and strategy lead at Build Up. Uh, Build Up is part of the steering committee of the Council on Tech and Social Cohesion. And Helena, Elena is a built peace building and mediation professional with over a decade of experience advising and supporting UN agencies, multilateral organizations, and NGOs working in conflict contexts and also in polarized environments, uh, both on and offline. And at Build Up, her work has a particular focus on the integration of participatory me methodologies uh, in peace processes and on the analysis of digital conflict drivers. Welcome, Elena. Um, and Enrique uh, Abravo Escobar is a senior program officer at the National Endowment for Democracy in the global team. Uh, he leads the, work, the team's work on democratic innovation, technology and democracy, and the integrity of the information space. Uh, he's been a huge champion of civic technology through NED's work, and is one of the catalysts for us having this panel. Uh, he's coming, I think, in the spirit of a critical friend to the sector to pose the challenge of how we contribute effectively. So welcome, Enrique. Maria Baron, you now all know. Um, but what you may not know is that she strongly argued for expanding civic space and public participation, and also documented and responded to limitations on freedoms and civil society imposed by government across the region. Uh, we're also joined by Claire Fouquier-Gazanius, uh, who leads, uh, is, Google's lead for civic partnerships across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, and works with government and civil society organizations related to Google's civic products and features. Uh, she works with both governments and civil society organizations, uh, including on misinformation, and has also worked to encourage civic engagement with Google's elections task force, so pretty busy at the moment, I imagine. Uh, all of which gives her a big well of experience to draw on in terms of how one of the big technology giants uh, is working internally and also with other collaborators. Welcome to you, Claire. And finally, Vakao is the senior policy analyst at Access Now and one of many of, uh, contributors to Taiwan's civic hacking community, GovZero. Uh, Vakao has previously served as a journalist and researcher for international NGOs and media outlets including extensive work on disinformation, and he's currently leading Access Now's research on the civic tech community and its impact on defending and extending digital rights in East Asia. He's recently completed a research project on civic tech communities safeguarding democracy and their role in that region, so welcome, Vakao. Having introduced all our amazing panelists, I'm gonna to turn to Enrique, really, to set the challenge for us. Um, just in a couple of minutes, Enrique, what are you seeing and what are you concerned about? Um, is this thing working? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for everybody for being here. Um, so I already introduced myself. Well, I don't need to introduce myself. Um, but I work for the National Endowment for Democracy. Just a quick note on that. So the National Endowment for Democracy is a U.S.-based private foundation that is publicly funded 
and we work to support uh, civil society around the world that are working on strengthening democracy and protecting human rights. We do have a focus on countries uh, in the global south or global majority, and that's mainly what we do. Uh, we're mainly a grant-making organization. Um, as the name says, we, we work on democracy, and this has been a long period, almost two decades of democratic decline. And I was thinking, hearing Maria earlier and Luis earlier, man, do I really wanna be like the doomsday speaker today? Like, I don't know if I wanna feel that way anymore, but I, I think it is important to, to say, you know, this is the context in which we are operating. Um, we, we do see a very dramatic erosion of democratic practices, norms, and values around the world. This is not limited to the global majority countries. This is everywhere. Um, I don't need to tell many of you guys that are from Europe, uh, you know, having seen some of the election results here and, you know, where the, the, the outcomes are and, and where things are heading in many parts of the world. So this is a, a worrisome time. So when we think about this context, and I think you know the pandemic was also a big, a big factor in wars around the world. There are many reasons why uh, people are very, very frustrated with with democracy. Um, I I tend to think that you know democracy is something that, for some of us, is of course a very principled issue. This is the best way to manage. Uh, power relations is the best way to get people to have a voice. Um, but for many people, it may be that democracy is only worth it as long as it delivers, right? Like, if it's a system that delivers to the people and people have a better life, that's what they aspire. They may not have a principle, normative take on why democracy is, is great. So one has to accept that reality, and so then one has to think about, okay, so how do we get all these democratic systems to be resilient, to be sustainable in the long term? So we have this crisis, or we have this crisis of democracy. For many of us, the analogy is, it's like the house is on fire, you know, the democratic house is on fire today. And those of us who are working in this space want to be supporting the firefighters we need to make sure that we have the right support for people who are fighting the fight of democracy and human rights. When we think about this in these terms, then we have to think about what civic tech can do and how it inserts itself into this house on fire situation. And I think for many people that are not familiar with this, with this sector, and that includes a lot of people that are managing funds in philanthropy, civic tech sounds like the sandbox, no? It's that place where people are experimenting with cool things and technologies, but that are very disconnected from the firefighting activity that many other organizations are doing. So to me, the main challenge that I keep posing to uh, partners in the civic tech community is how do we connect the sandbox work to the firefighting work that is so necessary today. And it's very different from the type of work that I think civic tech and many advocates of other parts of democracy would have pursued, let's say, in the late 1990s or even in the early 2000s when, when really democratic values were in expansion, when rights expansion were at place. Every, there was a lot of enthusiasm and there was a lot of intention to push governments to just be more transparent, more open, more accountable. We were, at that point, I think, winning this boxing match. But today, quite frankly, Democrats in the world, we're like against the ropes in this boxing match. So can we pursue the same strategy that we were pursuing when we were about to get a knockout, when we are against the ropes? I think, no. The answer to me is we can't pursue that. So that level of awareness, I think, is important. So my initial take will stop there, but that's the provocation I have. I will say, how do we connect the sandbox to the, to the, house, to the house on fire? 
I'm going to, thank you, Enrique. I'm going to pass straight to Maria uh, to ask if you have the same concerns and if you're seeing the same things or if you're coming at it from a different angle. And what do you think about that question of the sandbox and the reality of what's going on? So, so you, <coughs> is it working? It's you. <coughs> so, it's very interesting because we agree. But, um, not, not much, but in, in this, the region that I work with, which is Latin America, so we decided to measure, uh, you know, that the level of democratic backlash that we are living through <coughs> a little bit before of the pandemic. So this is like for five years we've been doing it. And so what we do, this is the, the first and only tech point that I'm going to talk <laughs> about. Uh, and so what we have is um, a system where we can uh, uh, extract uh, the data from the base from the databases of the parliaments of Latin America. And whenever they update their databases, we get a red flag. And so we know when a parliamentarian has introduced a specific bill on anything. And so we can know if there's a backlash on any of the rights that we're following right away, mm. like 10 minutes after, <coughs> because the robot does it updates it every 10 minutes. And so, and we follow six rights in, in Latin America. So access to public information, freedom of expression, association, demonstration, uh, civic participation, and privacy. And so what we do with this, uh, I, I shared Gemma, uh, no, never mind. <laughs> uh, so we put, all of this information that we've found uh, together with uh, sort of um, uh, speeches of high ranking public officials. For example, I'm going to kill uh, someone. And so that goes, so we capture that. And we put all that together and create sort of a, um, a, a newsletter, a MailChimp, whatever, to a specific number of people only from Latin America. And we see that there's backlash in any of the rights um, since uh, before of the pandemic, like 2018. So for example, in uh, NGO registration, there's limits into the money coming in and going out of the country, limits on the registration, limit on the accountability that they, they have to uh, do to the government where they're located. Uh, then there's uh, this issue of, um, in Latin America, uh, states of exemption, so you can't demonstrate, uh, or there's limits to demonstration, and also uh, there's a big uh, sort of a new concept, or at least uh, new for us, uh, which is issues where they deny uh, access to information on the grounds on securitization, in a way, so it's all on the grounds of security, national security, internal security, personal security, whatever, but they, they constantly deny uh, and uh, sort of have interrupted in many cases the proactive transparency of the acts of government. Um, and so if my, my, my question to, to you and the public would be, so we put this all of all of this information together with a lot of uh, level of detail, like for example, this parliamentarian introduced this specific bill and we have the bill and is planning on generating a debate uh, like in a month or whatever. Usually we know that in very, very average, uh, that when a bill is introduced, we have at least six months very average, we can talk about different sectors, but very average until it becomes a law. So what can we do? So my question would be, what can we do? Because it's not enough, the, a newsletter to be shared with friends that are already convinced that this is happening. And then we also do like a zoom in, in like the Northern Triangle, which is um, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, which is like a hotspot. 
in Latin America, not for the good reasons. Um, and so we share this information specifically and more detailed to those organizations that live there and that usually are subject to these regulations. But, you know, and we help them on a bilateral basis. How can we make this really more uh, universal, more, more rapid, uh, more concrete, connect with uh, campaigns that are already happening and to, in order to prevent these governments to, to do this? And me, uh, many happens, they te uh, many, uh, and many times they test. Like if they do one thing, two things, three things that are not right, then the tenth thing, it's, they know that, that, that they won't have a contestant uh, against them. So just that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. So I'm going to come, Elena, to you now. Maria's posed the challenge of us coming together constructively. <laughs> And I think your career has been really looking at the challenges of, of both coming together constructively in person and in online spaces. What are you worried about in, in your work and, and how do you see technology interacting with it? I thought you were going to ask me something different, but I'm going to go with that. <laughs> um, I, so I, I think it's really interesting because I, I don't really see my work as part of the civic tech space mm. often. Um, and so I, I find it fascinating the way that these questions are coming about. Um, in a lot of the places where um, build up works, uh, democracy has been against the ropes um, for a long time. So um, a lot of our programming um, is, for example, at the moment in, uh, in Somalia and in Sudan, it's just a very different um, story. But one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to um, is how uh, technology is impacting conflict drivers. So you said that in the, in the beginning. Mm. Um, and very specifically, um, in, you know, when we think about how conflicts uh, become intractable um, in a lot of places, it's connected with how people form their identities. Um, and so one thing that we've been looking at a lot is the impact of um, the way that uh, digital communications have become more democratized, more prevalent, um, is impacting the way that identity formation happens. And specifically, um, how um, the way that we share information on social media and in other digital spaces um, is leading to a kind of polarization which is effective rather than issue-based. And this is where it connects to democracy. So issue-based polarization, people disagree about topics. That's part can be part of a constructive democratic dialogue. Mm -hmm. Effective polarization, people disagree because of who they are. So I'm not going to agree with you because of your position, because of your background, because of your tribe, because of the color of your skin, because of your socioeconomic status, whatever it is. Um, and that is at the root of intractable conflicts. And so I think that um, that's the thing that, that we're paying most attention to because it, it, it's at the intersection of essentially how conflicts become intractable and also I think how democracy is eroded. Um, in a lot of places, and I was thinking a lot about the Guatemala, El Salvador, et cetera, triangle that you were talking about, where I think that also comes out. Um, one thing that I think is, I don't know if this is an answer to your, you know, how do we go from being part of the sandbox to being part of firefighting, but one thing that we've been thinking a, a lot about is that perhaps those of us in the sort of civic tech, I guess now, including myself, I, I think of myself more as peace tech, but that's all, it's all the same, it's adjacent. Um, is to not just think about um, what technologies we can use to, to strengthen democratic processes or participatory processes, but also how we can um, speak to large technology platforms um, or companies about how their design is impacting democracy. So this is at the center of what the Council for Technology and Social Cohesion um, does. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how particularly the design um, of social media is impacting conflict drivers. Uh, so there's a, the fact that recommender algorithms uh, maximize for what they maximize um, has an impact on the content that we see, obviously, and also um, on the way that people form identities, and that impacts conflict. Um, so perhaps one of the ways to get out of the sandbox um, and into uh, firefighting mode is to um, uh, increase the pressure um, on um, what we see as some of the, of the drivers of conflict that are coming through uh, digital platforms. That's one thing. And then the other thing, can I say one more, one more thing? Sure. Is that um, at, at least in the, in the work that we've done, um, one thing that, that we've found, you know, 
I, I really like this thing that you said about we're, we're seen as the sandbox. You know, we, we suffer from that as well sometimes where they say, oh, you know, here's this tech process and then like here's the actual peace process that's going on. And so the, the way that um, I think we enter into, into actually being part of the, of the firefighters for, for democracy and, and for peace in, in our case is to be absolutely integrated into a peace process. Um, so for it not to be something that is sitting out here, but that is integral to the way a peace process is run. Um, so maybe later I can give some examples of, of how we've seen that work. And, and I, I really like this idea of essentially thinking of whatever the tech component of uh, the work is being about 10% um, of, of, the, of the overall process work. So it's much more about the process than it is about the tech itself. Thank you. I'm going to bring Claire in at, at this point. Um, one of the potentially ways in which the social media environment is not working for cohesion is, is the misinformation and disinformation we're seeing. Is that the thing that you're concerned about most in your work when you're talking to civil society? Is that what your focus has been this year, particularly in such a big election year? Yeah, I, yeah definitely. And, and I, also, um, I, I also loved your framing. Uh, Enrique, this has also been very much like the framing of my career so far. Like I started maybe like 12 years ago in the open data space. Uh, volunteering in, uh, in the Open Knowledge Foundation, joining the French government to open up as much data as possible. Then I joined Google to work on civic participation, like make sure people could vote. And nowadays I'm still doing a bit of that, but I'm focusing more and more on mis and uh, disinformation. So, so I've seen, <laughs> I, I've seen this evolution uh, myself, yeah, this spectrum. And this also reminds me of uh, like the famous uh, Martin Luther King quote, like, the arc of progress is not linear. And uh, it's definitely, I think, what we are all, uh, all feeling uh, now. So on, on this topic of myths and, uh, and disinformation, like, we could say many things. What, what struck me, actually, is uh, how in this mega election year, uh, both civic participation and this and misinformation are connecting because we, because we are seeing more and more narrative of um, disinformation on the ways to vote, for instance. Mm. A lot of disinformation on this way of bo voting being not safe, this way of voting uh, being plagued with, uh, with error, which encourage people not to participate. And this is a way also uh, where democracy is, uh, is decreasing. And so in terms of what we do on mis and dis disinformation and what uh, I am focusing on and many team at Google, Right now, it's, it's mainly three things. One, it's um, pre-banking. Uh, so this is a new, I mean, new. It started in the 60s, so not that new, but it's a, it's a technique to try to preempt misinformation, disinformation by training in, in the way citizen about how to recognize this technique. And, and we, we have done research with uh, Bristol University and Oxford University recently showing that it's really ex effective as a tool. So people who have been <coughs> exposed to this type of mini video explaining um, disinformation and misinformation techniques such as deconstructualization, sorry, <laughs> uh, are 70% more likely to recognize this uh, when they are exposed again. So, so I find this technique quite interesting. I, I hope we, we do more of this, not only us, but others. So that's one, uh, one technique. Second thing we work on uh, a lot is uh, making sure we, have, uh, we are working uh, to, to have uh, authoritative sources and official information as much as possible at the top of every feed uh, every uh, search uh, search platform like for instance I, I worked uh, like over the weekend on uh, in Brussels uh, just to make sure that when people type uh, live election results European Union they see straight the results coming directly from the EU Parliament so we try to avoid like misinformation on this by being like by having this information at the top and the third thing is uh, for us working a lot with the fact-checking community. So, so at the end of a cycle when misinformation did happen, like making sure it's getting debunked. And we are working in Europe a lot with uh, 
European uh, Fact Checker Standard uh, Network funding them and funding this important work. But we, I feel we also need to work more on how to make sure the fact checking is actually coming back to the citizen. Because it's an amazing work, it's a lot of time, but sometimes like the feedback loop is not, like people like us are exposed to fact checking, but maybe not every uh, citizen. And it's also where I agree with your perspective on tech being uh, uh, sometimes like maybe 10 or, or a, li a little bit more of the effort, but much more is needed on the process and the cultural change. Thanks, Claire. I wanted to bring in Vakao on a kind of another angle to the complex problem. So you've got people in conflict, which is getting exacerbated online, governments pushing down, but also that makes the work harder to do. And I think part of your research has been looking at people who are working in civic tech in really challenging contexts. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Vagal, based in Taipei, so covering our work in East Asia. So, uh, yeah, we did our regional uh, research projects. We do it with uh, in-person and online interview with different civic tech projects from South Korea, from Japan, from Taiwan. We consider these three community based in these three uh, countries. They are the same group who grew up together. I mean, they initiated this project, this community, like almost the same time. But you do see different pathway for them to grow or for them to build up their partnership with different sector and how they react to the threats to democracy and then what kind of their role to play in their own society. So what we have seen is uh, because these three democracies are still developing itself uh, in the region, so these three uh, civic tech community are really bonded to the uh, development of democracy in these three societies. So in that perspective, civic tech community itself become almost like a front line when we talk about uh, democracy backlash or any kind of threats to, to democracy. So some of the projects, they become targets when, when you see like political power shift or when you see foreign actors trying to influence the democracy there, or just because the society itself is becoming too polarized, so that these projects becoming a target on the internet or in person. But on the other hand, you do see this civic tech project trying to strengthen the understanding or so-called trust on technology with different like real on-hand projects. They go into schools, uh, having the high school students and junior high school uh, learning what is civic tech, how to initiate their own projects, or they just provide an uh, online uh, platform for people to do the fact checking by themselves. And also they uh, provide like in-person workshop. So you do see like, like the civic tech community becoming very active in terms of defending and safeguarding democracy. But on the other hand, they need support because they are on the front line if conservative parties, they got the powers, they are the first group to be targeted to attack because they don't want to see, you know, uh, all this freedom on the di different kind of data rights or they don't want to see active citizens to initiate their own projects. So these civic tech projects, they become, mm, they, they are suffering from legal suits or legal charge and also some of them actually got uh, death threats um, on the internet because of the project they are doing. So. Our way, uh, as, as now, we are trying to help our community to defend and strengthen their rights on the internet. So we are working with uh, these three communities in South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, trying to figure a way like how to help the public sector and platform and maybe international NGOs and international uh, organizations to know what's happening in, in this region. And given, you know, there's more and more tension in the region. You also see uh, foreign actors to these three democracies and trying to influence their safety or their understanding of democracy. So what kind of support can be provided? What kind of uh, framework, regional framework, can be a safeguard for these three communities? That's what we are now thinking about. Thanks. I'm going to turn to the room now, and if we could pull up the results of the poll, maybe get some, if everyone is willing to crane around, get some quick reactions from you. So we've got corruption coming in as a big yes 
along with disinformation as potential problems. I guess, uh, Claire, are you surprised to see disinformation as the one of the main areas there? No, no, I'm not surprised. It, it makes a it it makes a lot of sense given uh, what we what we are seeing and maybe yeah, the, the difference I see between misinformation and disinformation is in disinformation you have a, you have an intent to spread yeah. yeah because sometimes we use them like interchangeably but yeah no I uh, I uh, I agree uh, a lot uh, with uh, like yeah <laughs> with with this on corruption uh, it's definitely a, a really really critical topic it's not a topic I'm I'm working on uh, myself but uh, but yeah yeah go on. so i think i think it's always really interesting that disinformation is bigger than misinformation and misinformation is bigger than polarization because claire is right disinformation is an intent right but it's also the tip of the iceberg the reason disinformation goes viral is because people share it and share it perhaps without the intent share it out of ignorance or out of um, some kind of association with whoever has shared that disinformation, which is polarization, which is this issue of like people wanting to share what someone else said, not because of what it says, because it, but because of who that person is, right? So I always find that, it, I find it fascinating that we focus so much on disinformation when actually we should be thinking about polarization much more and the, the reasons why people share. And that's, for me, I, I thought it was fascinating that you brought up pre-bunking and that so much of the, of the conversation has been around fact-checking, um, when at least in the context where I work, you know, in, in many ways providing that kind of information is not what's going to shift the deluge of misinformation because the reasons people share have to do with identity politics. And so a conversation about identity is what's needed. I don't know where that leads us, but I just wanted to make that comment. <laughs> I think you might lead us into some <coughs> concrete examples. If, you, if you're sort of suggesting that the real problem is upstream and that disinformation is a symptom in some ways yeah. of what's happening um, in terms of identity, are there things you would draw out from your work? Uh, kind of coming back to Enrique's challenge of if we want to be effective, what's things that you're seeing working or, or sort of notable things that you're not seeing working? Yeah, I mean, I think um, at least in, in very polarized and conflict-affected environments, what, one of the things that, that we're seeing is that you do need to dig into why people share. Mm -hmm. um, so, so not so much providing alternative things, but what are the motivations behind that? Um, and that requires some kind of dialogue or conversation. So to give like two concrete examples of things that we've seen work, one is um, on social, so we've done a few projects where on social media, um, feeds that were particularly polarized. Um, we had people trained in nonviolent communications and peace building intervene in the comment threads. And the single thing that was most effective was to, to not to try to debunk or counter what was being said, but to ask, um, uh, can you tell me more? Mm. Um, can you say more? Can you, you know, basically to offer an opportunity for people to be heard? Because a lot of the time what's happening is people are shouting into the void and it actually paradoxically calms the conversation down. So that's one on the peace building side. I think on the design of tech side, um, this is not work that we've done, but there's a significant amount of, of research on how changing um, the, the way that algorithms rank content can have an impact on the polarization of the overall conversation. So things like bridge, bridge, bridge building algorithms, which I'm sure people in this room already know about, um, can well, have an impact. Say, say a little bit about them. Oh, sure, okay, so, so most, most um, most recommender algorithms on, on, on most social media platforms, but not everyone, um, uh, maximize for engagement, essentially. So uh, that's what they're looking to put at the top is whatever you've engaged with most and they create profiles. And I don't need to go into all of that. Um, but there are other things that you could maximize for, right? So you could maximize for, um, I don't know, the veracity of the content or you, you could maximize for other things. But one of the things that's been experimented with in a few platforms is maximizing for um, how much a piece of content is liked by people who disagree about other things. So because we have profiles about groups of, of users, then you can say this piece of content was liked by people, let's say de Democrats and Republicans both liked this piece of content, let's maximize for that. And that tampers the polarization and has an impact on misinformation and therefore disinformation. 
And you can see this in use in some of the big tech platforms. I think I've seen it on, on well, social media. Is it LinkedIn that's implemented this? I felt like I saw it on Twitter or X the other oh, day where it was a community notes. Uh, yeah. Community notes. Yeah. And this, this was uh, a community note that's been uprated mm -hmm. by people across a broad range of views. So right. you can see that too. Yeah, so community notes uses it. And I thought one of the bigger, sort of biggish, like, I can't remember if it's LinkedIn. I don't, I don't want to get that wrong, but somebody who's got a phone out can Google that. <laughs> um, and I think I think it might maybe it might have been LinkedIn. So, yeah. Really interesting. Enrique, uh, you you posed the question to the panel and, and raised the sandbox metaphor. Are there things that you think are not working? Well, I remember in the past, um, for many years I worked in Latin America before I worked on a more global scale. And it was during the years when there were a lot of efforts to press for access to public information laws. In Argentina, in particular, in Paraguay, Mexico already had one. So there was a lot of civil society work carried out on just let's get these regulations to be there so that we can access the information. Of course, the premise was always more access to information will bring more accountability, transparency will bring more accountability, accountability will bring some degree of you know, success in anti-corruption efforts because people will be exposed and, and so people will be you know, shamed and there will be consequences. I think the problem was with that last bit of the situation, the consequences. Because it did happen, like more access to information did create more transparency. We did see a lot more even just media coverage on you know, scandals that were shown through the good work of many of the people that were working on access to public information. The problem was the lack of consequences, no? So that's one thing that is still missing in the piece. Of course, it brings us back to the classic rule of law problem, and that's a very protracted problem, very structural, that is very difficult to, to tackle, but it is still, of course, however not so sexy it may be, it is still one of the main problems, no? But when we were working in those years, I remember telling many of Marias's colleagues, if you expect citizens to be the ones using access to public information to consult the budgets of the public schools in their neighborhood, you, like, you really don't know what the population is looking for, you know? because this is not what the average citizen will actually do. We need some form of intermediation between those who can access information and know how to do it technically and do it well, and then do a bit more chewing of the information and processing for the people to actually find it useful. So how do you want people to commit to the value of these pieces of legislation? Which is key for the legislation to be successful in the long term. This intermediation is what I found always sort of lacking, and I think civic tech could be doing some of that. And I'm sure there's some uh, good pieces of civic tech out there that I, I'm not aware of. But let me give you a very like rudimentary example of what I think this could look like. This is back in the day, you know, this is maybe about 10, almost 10 years ago. And you know, Yelp was very popular at the time, you know, this review platform for restaurants and Everybody at the time was using Yelp. I guess today people are really using more Google reviews, but at the time Yelp was the gold standard. And I was, I kept thinking, why is it that we can have a Yelp-like app for government services? Like if I need to choose the school to which my kid will go to, I want to know through some series of scoring and rankings how schools are doing in my neighborhood or where are spots open for them to go? Or how many beds available for pediatric are there in hospitals in my, in my city? These are ways to connect all that access to information to how people actually want to use it. And I just couldn't see those options. I couldn't see those, those um, ways to connect information to the use people want to have of otherwise very important public information. So, these are some of the things that have come to my mind, you know, and this is again 10 years ago, so I wasn't thinking democracy was so much at the, at the ropes, although it already was, like this is not a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. you know, Freedom House and others have documented really two decades of decline, so, but, but these are some of the ways that I think we need to, we need to figure out how to bring 
information and action to the population in a, in a feasible way. I want to open up to Maria, Claire, and Raquel on uh, examples that you think might point a way ahead or that kind of, in response to the question of consequences, what kind of partnerships do you think that means and kind of would be required to, to really address those problems? I actually wanted to build up on points that were uh, just uh, just made thinking about challenge and, and solution and partnership in response mm -hmm. to this. But, um, but yeah, to, I, I really agree with the point of like, let's make sure things actually work from a citizen user perspective. And I feel it's one of the big challenge of our field. Mm. Uh, the fact that we claim we are, uh, civic tech is user centric, but we, we sometimes don't put in the, the effort to, to actually make sure it works for the, for the citizen and we are, uh, and we are work and we are building with the citizen and with what works, what don't, doesn't work in mind. Like it's definitely a culture, um, like yeah, we, at Google, we have a UX researcher on the, on the team. Uh, we, we test everything. We do what I said about pre-bunking earlier, like this is something we tested with academics, but I think we need to, to be even more s systematic to make sure that uh, before building cool tech, we are really sure uh, it's, uh, it's actually um, effective. Another thought I had on that is uh, like in the topic of elections, civic participation and polarization, we know one of the key drivers to, to have someone like consider a different opinion is actually like in-person uh, human uh, contact. And, and this is very uh, low tech. And I really admire the work of um, small, um, of some um, civic tech organization, for instance, Avote in France. They both have a tech side, which is they build a platform to help with proxy voting, which is going to be a key issue for our upcoming election. But they are also doing a lot of grassroots community organizing, focusing on young people to make sure they are voting, they are participating, they know about the issue. And, and I love this combination of like, uh, yes, build, uh, have a, have a pat platform to solve one critical issue, but also make sure you do door to door and have this community engagement piece. So, so I feel it's, uh, it's also this type of organization that, that do very, uh, very effective uh, work uh, these days. Thanks, Claire. Maria, did you want to? I uh, was trying to avoid your question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got an even worse one coming up on Slido, so I'm going <laughs> to pre-thank all the panelists uh, for being on stage for the really difficult questions. But. Uh, no, I, I was uh, uh, thinking of sort of the old way that we do things. Uh, and I think there's, so we've reached a moment where we need to uh, sort of go the extra mile, get creative and try to think, uh, you know, what we've done that is not working. The first one is, uh, and we've had, I think the conversation, uh, this conversation with you, Enrique, and we've had it with several organizations that are not specifically tech, mm. but work on anti-corruption. and and it's this one. So we've been, I don't know if successful, but we've worked for the past 15 years trying for the governments to comply with a sort of supermarket list of frameworks and ideas and actions like, you know, meetings and stuff on anti-corruption. And we were very, um, concrete in telling the governments that that was the way that they were going to deliver uh, sort of on a, on a different way of government and also even trust. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't happened at all. And also you have, like you were saying earlier with one of our colleagues here in the, in the room that the best uh, evaluated uh, access to public information law is from Afghanistan. And so, so there's a big, big gap there. So the supermarket list, because Mexico has it, uh, I don't know, Colombia has it, many, many governments have it, 
but they still coincide and live with those big, big corruption and petty corruption, both, all, all of the above mm. uh, cases. So what, what philosophical discussion can we have in order to be more effective yep. uh, in, in that? And th this is not only in, in sort of if we divide our issues in corruption, but this is transparency, this is accountability, this is, so w one time I'm just, I'm closing with this, in OGP we decided uh, to sort of work on trust when I was in, in the steering committee of OGP. And so there was a, a booklet on all of the, you know, parliamentarians and mayors and governors and presidents that wrote little pieces on how to deliver trust. And the truth is no one knows how to deliver trust. There's a couple of variables um, that can indicate, but it can happen or it cannot. And the, and the exogenous variables, we, we never know. And the truth is that if we knew the supermarket list for uh, uh, delivering trust, everyone would do it, and no one has been <laughs> so successful. So just not to be so uh, <laughs> um, a downer in this uh, conference, but that's my, my view. I think you've got to deal with the reality as you see it. And uh, Raquel, is there anything you would pull out as an example of something that you think is promising or interesting in such a difficult kind of climate? Yeah, sure. Um, but I have to say, in the room, there are actually different uh, participants. They are all from Gov Zero community here. So I will encourage you, if you want to know more examples, uh, got to talk to them because there are like hundreds of projects in Taiwan. Uh, but uh, I want to echo that the importance to reach out to the average citizens because for me, I, I, I don't only take that as a way to prove the value or the impact of your projects. It is also a way to, um, to counter the different threats to, to CV tech community or to your own projects because you need to get the support from the citizens. You need them to be your um, partners or your supporters because they are using your tools or your projects. So whenever you are being attacked on internet or if you're having a smear campaign from different uh, parties, then they know, you know what kind of projects you are and they know the value of yourself. So I think from the, the, the community in East Asia, they started around 10 or more than 10 years ago. They focus on really much about the code, you know, the cool stuff they are building up. <laughs> I mean, the coders and developers, they are building the fancy web page applications. But nowadays you see them going out to different community to share their insights, to teach them how to use these uh, tools or to involve them into the process of the development. So I want to give some examples on uh, uh, disinformation and misinformation. Uh, there are two, at least two projects from GovZero community in Taiwan. One is um, IORG, so the founder is actually here, Chi Hao, you can talk to him. They, they, um, then trying to provide different solutions to this information, uh, which means they collect all the data as much as they can from different platform, and then map how information flows between different accounts and different, different uh, platform. It is a way from data-driven uh, perspective to show uh, it's not only narrative work on, on the internet, like who is the bad guy spreading all the, all the disinformation. It's actually from the data you can see how things are moving or who are spreading this. So the, the way they are dealing with this topic is to collect data and making the data set and being open to everyone. So journalists, academics, or researchers, and, and even governments, if they are interested to know about the topics, they can actually to see from the data like what, what is so-called influ influence operation or who are the you know, COB working with each other, who are the malicious accounts. With that, uh, you can learn by yourself. It's not somebody telling you there's a problem called disinformation. It's you can see from the data. And coming with that, they go to the school. They work with the teachers mm -hmm. and then help the teachers de to develop their own curriculum based on the needs from their students. So 
you know, from data to the school, from data journalists to uh, teachers in the school. They're trying to bring that more result to different community and help them to understand this information is just a political issue. It's what's really happening on the platform, and they they use data as a way to talk to the people and without like different kind of partisan narrative or leveling on themselves. So data is really critical in the process just to show uh, the credibility of the project and also outreaching to different partners and sector is also very important. So our lessons learned from Taiwan is that how different projects, they cooperate with different sector, different partners. You don't see only like civil society working on this. T the government of Taiwan also providing like public co-program or they offer like a uh, civic tech hub for uh, the projects they can build their project there or to meet different partners at the hub that there uh, in person. So these, you know, creating all this space for pe different stakeholders to meet up, it's also quite helpful for the community itself. Thanks. I really like that, ex uh, sort of exposing to as many people as possible the problem and saying, look, here, here is a problem, here's the evidence of the problem. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn to the top rated question on Slido, which is a difficult one. I'm going to pre-warn you. So uh, how can civic tech help when democracy, law, and human rights are weaponized by totalitarianism to distort the democracy? So a difficult question. <laughs> but also the perfect lead into our next session, which is on difficult context for this kind of work. Any sort of immediate reactions uh, to that as a kind of uh, a, a challenge to be posed? I can give you the, the question again. So how can civic tech help when those concepts of democracy, law, and human rights are being weaponized in a totalitarian way, and they're sort of getting distorted and, and changing, perhaps, intentionally having their meaning changed and their kind of context changed. Maria, I'm going to come to you because you're nodding a little bit, like at least the problem is familiar to you. Thank you, thank you. I don't have the crystal ball, but um, so th that is true in many countries in Latin America and also it came a moment where <coughs> we don't know how the new presidents are going to be. And so you, you don't know if the next president that we have, a president we've had him for five months, and the same has happened in other countries, and you don't know how it's going to, to turn out, if a totalitarian or an okay or a very liberal. And so um, I think there's a good example, maybe uh, Enrique, you know it better than, than we do, uh, regarding that situation in Brazil with uh, Fernando Enrique, with uh, um, the other president in Brazil, uh, yeah. with Bolsonaro, sorry, and uh, and so uh, there's, I I tend to think that si since I'm not a tech person per se. Uh, I tend to think that always relying on the community, both inside and outside. Um, and I have had many examples on how that has worked, specifically in the Northern Triangle mm -hmm. and in parts of, of Latin America that, had, that the organizations had to rely on, on outside sources to be able to even work in the uh, context where they were uh, working. But still, uh, I mean, I don't I know sort of good examples to show in terms of civic tech. But I think what you say is interesting is like you, you can yeah. move activity to other places and that kind of international collaboration becomes more important in that context. And I, I think that in civic issues, uh, corruption, transparency, access to public information, uh, whatever, there is a very, very strong and mature community around the world that it has happened in Mexico as well. So when the government uh, backlashes or advances into some of the uh, people's liber liberties, there's really a strong uh, community outside uh, of the country that will not be threatened by that government and will not uh, sort of stop uh, on this uh, many times advocacy campaigns. And there's many, many organizations as well 
uh, international, I mean, or OGP or, or any alliance that you can think, uh, thematic, that can, uh, that has put issues together. Even, for example, there's the European Union has sort of this internal agency where they help human rights uh, activists around the world uh, through their embassies. And so there's an infrastructure, I would say, put together or already in place. Um, that is a good, that is good news. Maybe it could be good to rethink what can be done mm. uh, that more effectively. Because this doesn't uh, necessarily mean that uh, human rights um, activists in Guatemala will be able to stay in tho their posts and keep on doing the work that they do. Because that's the, I think that's the, one of the responses to this is that the people stop doing what they do and then the government has, or the government or whoever is, um, it could be the private sector as well, um, continues uh, sort of overstepping on, on the rights of the people. And so, yeah, just that. Okay. There was a couple of things to say. I mean, I don't have the answer, but I do think that uh, when we think about the weaponization of certain rights, you know, I, I do think there are certain issues, and this information is certainly one of them, where there is some degree of inherent struggle between different rights. You know? One is the right to expression, the right to have access to all sort of you know, opinions and information. And of course, the right also to, to have access to reliable information in many ways, or how do we combat this information while being you know, absolutely respectful of freedom of expression? Do we do content moderation that has some inherent challenges to freedom of expression? These are very difficult problems, no? And, and every region, every country has different traditions on this. I think Europeans see things in a slightly different way than the Americas and including both North and South America. I think these are some of the challenges in which we still need to figure out a way. I don't know that the technology piece is the solution, but we need to figure out what we want that technology to look like before we, we, we actually have the, the huge uh, reforms, no? mapping the hole and then trying to fill the hole yeah. rather than too much. I think, Eleni, did you want to come in and then Claire? And then we're finished. So just oh, two, sure. two very quick comments <laughs> before Gemma gets to our right. Go ahead. I'll be really quick. Um, I don't know that I have an answer to, to this issue around totalitarianism, but I think there may be some parallels to situations where um, essentially technology is being weaponized in a conflict context. Um, so one is um, to just think about um, how we can engage um, platforms that are being weaponized in a particular context um, to make changes um, that can protect um, people who are still um, you know, either fighting for peace or fighting for democracy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking a lot about the changes that Meta um, introduced in Myanmar um, following what was a, a very well uh, documented and well publicized uh, use of its platform to um, to, to essentially perpetrate uh, enormous amounts of, of, of violence. Um, so I think, I think that's one thing. So just thinking about how can we, um, how can we advocate for, for platforms not to be weaponized in a particular context, whether it's totalitarian or conflict. And then I think the other one um, is um, in, in, in the context of, of, uh, of peace processes, um, we've now seen a number of occasions where um, the, the, the sort of the weaponization of uh, platforms, and that can be anything, uh, not platforms, but just the internet in general. So anything from internet shutdowns to partial internet sh shutdowns to the use of uh, social media to promote certain narratives have been brought into um, uh, pre peace process negotiations. So the Libya um, peace process um, uh, in 2020, the ceasefire agreement, it was the first ceasefire agreement to ever um, have a clause about the use of social media in the conflict. Um, and now that's happening in a few other places. So I just wonder whether, um, you know, as part of sort of pro-democracy um, uh, 
uh, work in totalitarian regimes, something similar could happen where essentially the use of technology is introduced into the conversations about what needs to change. It's really recognising what a big role exactly. technology can play, yeah, either for good or ill. It's yeah. not quite civic tech, but I think it's, it's kind of, you know, it's the way that tech becomes civic. <laughs> and I think yeah. the, the borders of civic tech are not something we want to police because, yeah. you know, there's a fluidity around defining any field. Claire, I'm going to give you the chance to do the, the final word <laughs> in the panel. No pressure. Thank you so much. So, um, so yeah, to, um, on, uh, on this first question of, uh, of yeah, what we can do in this very complicated uh, context, uh, I think one point to Enrique has quoted is, yeah, there are difficult decisions uh, to be made. So, for instance, uh, in, um, in the context of civic participation, do you, you uh, really want to launch something that might have um, not uh, consequences that are unintended. So for instance, like if you know an election process is not done democratically, I'm not sure it's an amazing idea to promote and to launch a lot of tools related to civic participation because you might be legitimizing an election that's uh, not a true election. So asking yourself these, two, these tough questions. Uh, a second answer I would say on civic tech, how can civic tech help? There is a suite of tools that can help in this context. At Google, there is one part called Jigsaw that works on providing uh, activists, journalists, safe tools, such as uh, tools uh, like Project Shield to prevent denial of services attack or safe VPN. So to make sure when you are trying to change the system from within, you, you are not targeted and your identity can remain uh, safe and the information you are spreading can remain uh, out there on the internet. So, so there is also a place for this type of, uh, of tool. I also want to acknowledge the question that was just below on, uh, on yeah, t big tech company being part of a problem or, or the solution. Obviously, 10 seconds are not going to answer this question, but I feel one big part um, of this is making sure we work, like civic tech company work more, uh, and civic tech NGOs more, work more with uh, tech companies. And I just wanted to, um, to highlight the fact that there is, um, at least from, like from Google, we, are, we have just published uh, a call uh, called um, an impact challenge, uh, focusing on strengthening democracy in Europe. Um, and, and the goal is to work more with civic tech company on and NGOs and academics on this topic. Also at a time where I know less foundation, especially in Europe, are investing on this difficult topic of strengthening democracy. So, um, so yeah, that could be an interesting uh, opportunity to work uh, more together. Obviously not answering this question fully, but that's one little part of the, of the solution, so I would encourage you to, to look it up, uh, Civic uh, Impact Challenge on Strengthening Democracy in Europe, if you want to Google it. Thanks, Claire, and uh, thank you to all our panelists for taking on difficult questions and bringing a really nuanced view of how technology is playing into difficult contexts. Please join me in a round of applause for the panel. Thank you.